this course is about data analytics, right? That was an easy question, just FYI. Oh, one more thing. When I make jokes, you have to laugh. That's the kind of like part of the agreement that you laugh at my jokes, not at me, at my jokes. Like this one, that you're not listening to me. No, come on, like seriously. Uh, if we have this class, if the class is um, a one-way lecture, it's not, it's gonna be boring. And you will start, you will fall asleep most likely, and then you will start snoring. Don't do that. Now, one thing that I wanted to ex uh, uh, to explain first is why why is this lecture included in a data analytics course? Not everything that we will cover today is directly related is is directly like data analytics. So why? What's the story behind emerging technologies? Go ahead. It's always improving, yes. FYI, I'm not good with sports. So if I hit someone on in their face, it's not meant I can promise you. So I hope I won't make a mistake like that. Don't go later on and say that who we'll gave you this black eye. Well, Professor Issa gave me that black. No, no, please don't. Um, so technology is always evolving, right? There has always been technology. What's so different about today's technology? It's making life easy. So it has some benefits whereby using technology allows you to do your work more efficiently, right? So this is, I'm not that bad. Like she was like ducking, I'm not that bad, come on. Okay, okay, point well taken. So basically this is a good point that Nowadays, technology has become, uh, it's evolving, and we can add that it's evolving very fast compared to the past, right? This is one thing. The other thing is that it is bringing in some benefits to, let's specifically talk about business, so basically to the business world, and even in uh, accounting and in auditing, right? Okay. Who can give me an example of some of these benefits? Sorry? Tracking errors. So basically identifying mistakes and errors, right? Yeah, it's not my fault that you guys are sitting way in the back. Sure. So basically, what are some of the benefits that we're seeing today with technology in the business world? So com communication, easier communication. That's correct. Go ahead. They? Yes, yeah, so basically so far we have discussed how these, how technologies nowadays can improve, can identify errors and outliers, can help you with the efficiency and effectiveness of your, of your operations, right? So these are some of the benefits. What are some of the challenges? And just FYI, I won't be following the slides exactly as we did. I'm gonna just like, we're gonna have as this discussion, go ahead. So basically cybersecurity risks, this is a huge thing. Now, keep in mind that one of the drivers or one of the enablers of, um, of using data analytics, let's talk about data analytics at this point, is the fact that the data is digital nowadays. We have a lot more data than before. While this provides us with, with um, the advantage of being able to analyze it easily because it's digital as opposed to paper, uh, uh, data, it also brings in the challenge of cybersecurity risks, right? What else? Right. 
Now you need more technical skills. And this is why you guys are in this class. You guys are in this class. The reason why this class was actually approved as a required course for all accounting students, you are all accounting students, right? So, and now it's required for you guys to, in order to graduate, you have to take this course. Why? The reason is that every time we met with an accounting firm, usually we meet a lot with them because we have a lot of research conducted with them. They would ask us to teach our students the type of research that we do. I don't know if you know that, but our department is ranked number one globally in AIS research for the past 20 years. You talk about, data, uh, about AIS research, Rutgers is number one, hands down. N number one globally. That's not a joke. We have a very large team, have a big team of uh, PhD students and of faculty. We do research in AIS. A lot of examples that we discovered this in this semester that you guys covered in this semester come from the from this research. You guys had process mining, right? Process mining is an emerging is an example of an emerging technology. We're not we we're not going to cover cover that because you already covered it. But like basically, um, this is. An example of an emerging technology that we have been using for several years in our research. And it only made its way to the class, uh, to, to your classes recently. That's because you have someone like Professor Zhang, like, uh, and many other professors in this department who have AIS training. That's our background. Okay. This is to give you an idea. Now, this problem has gained a lot more importance recently. You guys are aware that the CPA exam is changing. Yes, it's changing. They are adding a lot more data analytics. They are integrating data analytics in the CPA exam. You guys have a competitive advantage compared to others. I mean, how many of you have already have like an intern? You're graduating this semester, I believe. Yeah, so how many of you have like an internship or a job already lined up? Okay, you do have that, right? The fact that you have this, and if later on you want to change, if you had an internship, how many of you like encountered something where like they do some kind of data analytics there? What did they use? Okay, this is one way. This is a cloud service, right? That allows them to run analysis. What else? Anyone use a different software or heard of a different software or uh, technology that's used there? Sorry? I couldn't hear you. Umia? I'm not familiar with that. Oh, I think this is an in-house developed one that's developed in-house. By the way, uh, most of the accounting firms, especially the big four, they have like customized. For example, EY, they have what they call the Helix, which is a customized version of Tableau, and they use it for analysis. You can access Microsoft or SQL. Yes, you can. Fatima, you're online. I cannot throw you. I can But anyways. Um, uh, um, anyway, so the idea here is that you are using different software. The software itself is not important. It's what you do with the software. Okay? Like visualization, which one did you use? Yes, Tableau. That's not a difficult question. You guys already use Tableau. Sorry, I forgot to do that. So, you guys. Use Tableau. You could have also used like ClickView. There is also Power BI. There are so many other software. The important part is not to learn a specific software as much as to learn a technique. Again, with a change in the CPA exam, what happened is they are trying to integrate more data analytics and to cover more data analytics across the curriculum. 
This is also important because it's not only AI, the AICP and NASBA who are making this change. AACSB, the organization that gives the accreditation for business schools, they are requiring business schools to integrate more emerging technologies across the business curriculum, not just accounting, the whole thing. Not just to give an, a course, it's a lot more difficult. There are some challenges to that. So emerging technologies is an area where we do a lot of research. That's my research area. This is where, this is what I do uh, most of my time. And I don't know if you know that, but like it's, it's a fun story. My daughter, a couple of years ago, she asked me about my research. And when I explained to her what I do in my research, she was like, that's it. That was very offensive, <laughs> but it is what it is. I do that for a living. The examples that we will be giving, that I will be giving today most of the time are from real projects, from real research projects. They are not hypothetical. They are not something that's kind of like just uh, a simulation or something like that. They come from real examples that from projects that we conducted with uh, the AICPA, with the accounting firms, with large companies, banks, etc. Okay. So let's start talking about this. This is what we will be covering today. We will talk a little bit about big data. What does it mean to use big data? We'll talk about continuous assurance, okay? We'll talk a little bit about exceptional exception. That's my dissertation topic. And to me, this is, we will talk about it. This is like my baby. After that, we will talk about Couple of ex a couple additional currently emerging technologies. Now, one of the things that make them emerging technologies is that they are at this point, they are in use, a little bit in use, but they're not fully adopted. They're not adopted at a very wide, uh, at a, like a widely adopted for multiple reasons. Okay. By the way, at any moment, if you have a question, please just inter uh, stop me and interrupt me at that, okay? So we'll talk a little bit about AI, about blockchain, about XBRL, the use of drones, text mining. And the last one is an example only and only if we get the chance to discuss it. Let's talk about big data. Who can tell me what's big data? Hint. So tell me, go ahead. Go ahead, sir. Okay, so big data is basically a large set of data, right? That is used to answer a question. That's basically typically all data. But specifically big data. It's big. That's the difference. And the funny thing is that there is no single universally accepted definition of what big data is. The idea behind big data is that it is too big to be analyzed using traditional methods. That's the idea, okay? And what's more interesting is that what is considered big data for a computer scientist is very different from what is considered big data for accountants and auditors. About 10 years ago, I, we got a data set from um, a large multinational company they sent us a data file that was 864 gigabytes. 10 years ago, especially 10 years ago, that was considered huge. 
The company could not even transmit the file electronically. They had to send us physically using the FedEx. They had to send us an actual hard drive with the data. From an accounting or auditing perspective, that was considered big data. It would take us like a week or so using a supercomputer or very fast computer, uh, like a server here, to run a single analysis on that data. If you give that data to a computer scientist, they will tell you, no, this is a small data. The reason is that they use also a lot of pictures and images. Anyways, what's another feature of big data? So we said that it is the volume. It's very big. What else? I won't be able. So those who are on the chat, please unmute you. I, I'm not, I can't monitor the chat. It's extremely difficult because I can't stand um, on the, next to the podium. I just walk around a lot. So if you can just unmute yourself and speak up, I would appreciate it. You will get virtual candy. Is it a structured data? Structured data, yes. So basically it's structured versus unstructured. What's structured data? Organized, organized in what manner? Sorry? In a way that we can easily understand it as human users, right? So usually in the form of what? Tabular form. Most of the time, this is in the form of tables. That's just very structured. You have a column, you have a, a row, or you have like columns and rows, and then you know that each row is one record. Each column is one variable or attribute, right? Or one dimension. So this is what we mean. Unstructured data, who can give an example of unstructured data? Unstructured data. You guys are the whole time on social media, right? Okay, not the whole time, except when you're studying for courses, but in general, you spend a lot of time on social media. That's unstructured, why? Facebook, yes. So basically it's not just Facebook, it's social media. It's what kind of data is there? Sorry? Names? What, okay, so what's the type of name, sorry? Personal information. Yes, but you're talking about the type of information. What's the type of data? Is it the videos and pictures? So it's videos, yes. So it's videos, uh, photos, text. All these are on social media, right? In general, this is a big data. Um, in our research center, for example, we have several papers where we analyze that. We use text mining to extract information from those. We had one of the accounting PhD students, for instance, she graduated last year. Uh, some of her research included examining how many pictures are there in government financial reports, for example. So she analyzed the text, extracted the images, and analyzed the, basically the percentage of images to text, etc. Some of you may say that, like, why would she do that? The reason why she did that was to actually try to use the, uh, to try to analyze or to see how the use of, uh, of images and pictures, for example, in financial uh, reports and government financial reports would relate to, for example, bad news. Like, are they covering bad news using pictures or are they using it to send signals or whatever? So this is another way of using that. This is kind of big data when you're using social media. What else? Those of you who drive, what? app do you use in your car? Google Maps or Waze or whatever. How does that work? What kind of data? Anyone uses Waze? 
Okay, how does Waze work? They give you traffic, right? Where do they get this information from? All the people using Waze. So basically, our, com our phones are continuously generating and sending data to be collected and to be used for analysis. A company like Google has the advantage or the capabilities of analyzing this kind of data in basically real time. That's why it can give you an updated, like it can read out very quickly and gives you the traffic information. Traffic information is based on each and every person who's using Waze on that road. They would tell you, this is the estimation. This is how they can actually test your, you know that it's easy to calculate your speed based on your GPS. Our phones are capturing GPS continuously. Now, so big data has like all these sensors. You know, like the sensors that are like, for example, um, sensors such as weather data. They are collecting data continuously. This kind of information is usually, usually not used a lot by accountants, right? I mean, however, again, one of our former PC students, she actually analyzed using uh, weather data. She combined weather data with financial, with financial information provided by the company to predict revenues for a large chain in the US. She actually was able to have a better prediction of revenues using weather data. You can think of it, think of it this way. Uh, if you have, for instance, an, um, say that you have a bad snow day. And the company is claiming that they had like a thousand customers can actually check the weather and see how it relates, how weather and the sales relate. Another way is sometimes some people use satellite imagery. They can take pictures of the parking lots of those large chain companies, of those large chains. And then they can, in reality, they can actually analyze those pictures to see how many cars they have. All these, all these kind of data is considered big data. Okay, now big data has advantages, like we said, can be used to provide you with very useful insights in real time or close to real time or whatever, but you can extract some very useful information. What is the downside of big data? So you need the skills, basically you need like additional skills to be able to run the analysis. That's true. You need some kind of skills to run analysis on big data. What else? You also mentioned it earlier. Yes, yeah, sometimes it's too much information. This is an important point. You get overwhelmed with the amount of information that you're getting. You get inundated with information, right? So just to go through that information is difficult. What else? You, also, you mentioned it earlier. Security risk and privacy risk, right? Just FYI, privacy is dead. Don't ever think that you have privacy. You don't. I don't have, I don't use social media. I'm one of those people and I don't use, uh, it's not that I don't use it because like my kids call me a, a boomer or whatever. And I know that you guys mean it in an offensive way, <laughs> but I understand that. It's not because of this. I'm actually one of those nerds who is very, very capable with technology. And so, and because of that, I don't use social media. I believe it is a huge privacy risk. However, the fact that I don't use social media would also flag me as an outlier. So it would put me on the map of anyone who's trying to analyze the data because I don't use it. You see, if you are completely off grid, that still on its own is also a flag that why don't you have any for example, if you don't use credit cards, why don't you use credit cards? There's something wrong here. All these things is just so that you would understand. You need to understand that big data, um, while it provides a lot of information, it does have its downside because some people want to just, um, they 
present big data as the best thing since sliced bread. It's like, this is it. It's big data. It's, Im it's amazing. It is good, but take that with a grain of salt. Give me a second. I don't want to So as we discussed earlier, we have the, the, the when you talk about big data, they talk about different Vs. They talk about like uh, for instance, uh, they talk about variety, they talk about volume, because again, it's different types of data. They talk about veracity and velocity. They keep adding beats. One important point that I would like to also highlight is the fact that they also usually talk about correlation as opposed to causation. This is an important point because, for example, in accounting and auditing, people like to use causation, that this item caused, like A caused B. With big data, it's also, it simply says that A is related to B. Like for example, some kind of analysis would introduce, would say that, or would show that in um, people who buy diapers also buy beer. It doesn't mean that because you bought diapers, you are going to buy beer, but why are they linked? They are associated, they are not, Go ahead. And beer. The baby is going to need diapers and beer. <laughs> no, it's it's not that. The the idea is that basically if you have a baby you're, you're buying diapers because you have a baby at home. The fact that you have a baby at home means that you are less likely to go out to the bar, for instance, to drink there. As a result, you will have to buy beer and drink it at uh, in your house. No, no, beer. You're not gonna give a child a baby beer. Please tell me you're not. Okay. No, that's okay, I'm just kidding. Yes, it's difficult with a mask, actually. I mean, I'm practically yelling, but it's difficult with a mask. Okay, so that's the idea. There are certain associations that can be uh, linked together. This slide simply tells us that there are there is a lot of data out there. It doesn't matter what we have, but like basically, you guys studied in, in intro to financial accounting and intermediate, etc. You learned a lot about journal entries, right? You guys realize that you will never ever use it in your life. As in, like you will never be asked to enter to make a journal entry. All this is automated. Do you go to the store? Have you ever seen someone in the store like you buy something and someone is literally writing the journal entries? What happens when you go to the store? Automated. They just scan a bar, like they scan something, and you're good to go, right? Some companies took it even to the next step. Like for example, Amazon store, right? You can log into your app. Just all you need to do is you walk in and you have your phone, you're logged in through your phone and everything else, like you go outside, you don't even need to check out. It's automatically added to your cart, it's automatically paid for, et cetera, et cetera. So all this information is entered auto automatically. I just FYI, these automated systems are some of the drivers and some of the enablers of the use of big data. Keep in mind that an advantage, a big advantage now is that the storage, the cost of storage of data went down significantly in the recent years. It used to be very expensive. I still have some hard drives and I kept them just like for fun that were like 500, for example, 500 gigabytes. They would cost me hundreds of dollars. So just have this like a small one. At the same time, I have like hard drives at home that are like over eight or 10 terabytes. They are much cheaper than the other ones. They became like really, I mean, companies now can afford easily to store as much data as like 
does it matter how much data they produce, like Walmart, like, or they kind of generate? So the cost of generating, collecting, and storing data went down significantly. Another thing that helps with the emerging technologies is that there is the technology itself that is used to analyze those large data sets are a lot more, um, they are a lot more affordable now. And this is why you can see it even with smaller companies. And even very, very small companies can actually subscribe to a, a, a what do you call it, um, like a cloud computing service rather than having to buy the software. There are still some software that are extremely expensive, of course. You guys will be using IDEA uh, after the break, right? IDEA from Caseware is one of the expensive software. Tableau, I mean, we are pampered, I admit, we are pampered as academics because we don't have money. Companies give us, now that's true. Academics are known like for like academic centers, et cetera. We don't have money, this is why we get it for free. Plus, they want us to use it for free because if we teach it in our classes, for instance, you guys are automatically familiar with that software. So it's like, they give us the software and then we, we, use, we become the advertisers. Remember, nothing is free. If you are using a free product, it means you are the you are the product. That's actually the truth. Okay, so these are, we could discuss that like basically all the types of uh, data that are generated. Any questions so far? Am I going too fast, too slow? Are you falling asleep? Well, I mean, that's a legitimate question. I did have some, I mean, I've seen some people, not in my class, thank God, but like in certain classes where I see some student would fall asleep, those are. In one instance, I, the one, one student was actually snoring. Oh yeah, loudly. <laughs> I was in the audience at that point and I was like, okay, thank God, I'm not the professor here. <laughs> Continuous auditing, when you talk about, when you, how, how many of you heard of continuous auditing? Put down your hand, come on, give me a break. You have to hear of it, otherwise you will never finish here. Continuous auditing is a concept that was developed by one of our faculty members when he was uh, still a consultant at Bell Labs. It was in the late 80s early 90s. The concept behind continuous auditing is to do what? As the name says, it's to run analytics at close to real time. The idea is not to run it every second, but this is in comparison to, uh, to traditional audits. So what traditional audits are periodic audits, right? How often do they usually take place? Sorry? Once, once or twice a year, right? This is for external auditors. For example, they have to they issue an opinion once a year, right? What about internal auditors? Big companies who can have resources, they can only afford to have like maximum once every six months. So if you steal money from the company, it will take them like six months to catch you. I'm not advocating that you should do that. Just understand this. I'm not saying that you should do that. But the idea is that if you do, it takes a lot of time. If someone steals money from the company, it usually takes some time. However, the concept of continuous auditing is to do something that most accounting faculty and most auditors, they don't like when we say that. You guys studied a lot about um, sampling, right? They teach about sampling in auditing classes. You've taken the auditing class, right? Then they teach you about sampling. What's the magic number? What's like, what's the sample size that you need to take? There are no like structured things. They tell you that, okay, you need to get some, like a representative sample. What's a representative sample? If you wanna Google it, Google it. What is a sample that accounting firms use? What's the sample size? Go ahead. 
20%, right? So if you have, for example, a data set like the one that I analyzed 10 years ago, uh, 864 gigabytes, and I've had like millions of records. Let's say it was just 1 million records. 20%, that's 200,000 transactions. Do you really think that an accounting firm has the capabilities, time, employees, et cetera, to analyze 200, that you talk about examining each transaction from A to Z. Can they actually analyze 800, 200,000 transactions? Okay, what do they usually, what's the size that they actually usually do? 50 or 100? They look at 100. If the, they find something bad, then they increase the size of the sample. But in general, it's what? It's like 100. I mean, give me a break. I don't believe that 100 transactions or 1,000 transactions is representative of millions of records. If you're trying to talk about credit card transactions, you have every month, you have hundreds of millions of transactions. Do you really think that, for example, a company like like a city or like uh, like uh, a bank like City would run the analysis using just like take a sample? What sample is representative of that? The concept of audit of continuous auditing is audit by exception. So rather than taking a sample, you analyze hundred percent of the population. Once you have hundred percent of the population, you are more likely to identify the instances or the records that are more or less problematic. They violated a certain rule. They created a problem. Uh, they caused an issue. You did process mining. You had two types of variants. You had acceptable variants, and you had variants, what you call notable variants, right? Acceptable are fine. Where did you focus your, F, your uh, audits? You were looking at the ones that are not acceptable. Why? Auditing is risk-based. You talk about audit risk, about inherent risk. You talk about fraud risk, etc. It's risk-based. Auditing is risk-based approach. When you're thinking about this, is why we have internal controls. That the, the whole concept of auditing is what you're identifying certain. This is what why you do control risk assessment. You're identifying those risks. You look at the controls that are put in place to mitigate those risks then you have to test those controls to make sure that they actually work. If there are any issues, you run additional tests. And if you find that there are no problems, then you issue a clean opinion. That's in, 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 in layman English. This is how auditing works. That's, what, that's your job. You identify the risks of material misstatement of, for example, uh, that the documents are not fairly representative of the company's financial reports, et cetera. Then you look at the controls, you test them, and you base your opinion on your findings. We did that in process mining. Process mining is like, it's like test of controls on steroids, right? Did you notice that? You're not analyzing, you're not taking a sample. Keep in mind that it was a very small data set that you had, but you're not actually Taking a sample, you analyze each and every case. And then you identify the ones that were acceptable, the ones that were not acceptable. And at that point, you deal with, with those things. That's the concept of continuous auditing. It's audit by exception. You run analysis on 100% of the population, and then you find uh, exceptions. The, the idea is that. Those ex exceptions are some kind of violation. They are some kind of outlier. They are not the norm. So you, if you are only able to look at specific number, you are better off looking at those exceptions. That's a concept. Siemens, for example, they had a project, like in one of the projects, we actually had a project that was before my time at Rutgers. They had a project with Siemens where they, like, our research center created a continuous control monitoring system for them that would continuously analyze the data. In fact, currently, management took over like for financial services, Siemens, what they do is they run analysis on a daily basis. They run 100% of the, they test 100% of their transactions on a daily basis. 
every violation or any problem or any outlier that they find is flagged. An email is sent to the business owner, to their manager, to the auditor, and that keeps showing until it is resolved. So if it keeps showing every because they are running the analysis every day, so it keeps showing until it's resolved. If within a week or two it's not resolved, for example, the auditor can interfere and can investigate it. The advantage is that Siemens are able, Siemens financial services are able to actually fix any of these problems before closing the books. That requires, this is provides the ma management and internal audit, et cetera, with a lot more up-to-date information. Plus, it minimizes the work that they have to do after the fact, after the problem, after closing the books and they have now to make all these kinds of, of adjustments, et cetera, right? So this is the advantage of using continuous auditing. Any questions? Okay. And again, the idea here is not that we would do, uh, like we would actually investigate each one of them. It's to just like run the analysis on 100% and then identify the exceptions. Each one of these squares, this is just a selection of the projects that we had in the, our research center. Each square is actually a whole project, either with a bank or with an organization, uh, or for example, with um, uh, like a company, et cetera. To just give you an example, we recently concluded a project with the AICPA and the accounting for the big accounting firms, like the big four plus four and CPA Canada, where we ran multiple projects. One of them was where we combined multiple technologies. So for instance, we ran, we had a project uh, that the continuous auditing combination with process mining. Because the data sets were large, we needed to have both, like a combination of both. Like this is something that, and the reason why we talk about this, this is something that is now being implemented. It was theoretical in the past. A lot of people did not have the technology or the data available, but now they do, and they started to do more of full population testing. How many of you heard of full population testing in, not in this class, in different classes? You heard about full population, where, if I may ask? Maybe in your internships, et cetera, so where? Okay. Was it advisory services or was it assurance? Assurance. In general, by the way, a lot of these technologies that are that we're discussing today are used more by the advisory side of accounting firms. The reason they do that is simple. The st current standards do not really encourage accounting firms to use advanced analytics. Because if you run an advanced analytics or 100% population testing and you identify, say, 500 exceptions, according to the PCAOB, you have to investigate each and every one of them. Now, most of them will be just like false positives. They're not really true problems or they are like for the amount of $5 or something like that. However, if there's an audit failure later, at a later time, you as auditor will be liable if you identified an exception and you did not act upon it. But technically speaking, it's not re it's prohibitively expensive. It's too costly for accounting firms to investigate each and every exception that they find. Because they are bound by the standards and they have to do that in this way, many of them, they actually do it in what we do what we call parallel audits. So they do it, but they don't include it in the official audit. At that point, they do it just because after all, they want to be more confident in the opinion that they will issue. And on the advisory side, they don't really care. They want to prove that they are finding problems. But the fact that the standards are slow to change, I'll give you an example. If Professor Zhang gives you an assignment now, and she will tell you, if you do it correctly, you get no extra credit. There's no extra credit for doing that correctly. If you don't do it, there's no penalty, but if you do it and you make a mistake, you will lose points. Who in the right mind would do that? I know I would not. 
And that's the same situation here as far as advanced data analytics are with accounting firms. If they run advanced analytics, they don't find the problem, that's good. If they do that and they find the issues, they have to fix them. So they would be like, okay, why even bother? I'm not going to do that. This is one of the problems in, advice, in, in the assurance services. Um, I left this slide, by the way, at the end, if we have time and you are interested in talking about any of these projects, I'll be happy to discuss more of those. Okay, exception and exceptions. That's the title of my dissertation. When I selected this title, I was told that this is not a good title. A senior faculty told me that this is not a good title. Who can tell me why? Seems like redundant, right? So redundant, exceptional exceptions. That was not the reason. It's a good point, but that's not the reason. What do you think? Why? Go ahead. It sounds fraudulent. Um, I, I believe you mean that, for example, that exceptional means that this is kind of usually it's a good thing. Exceptions is a negative thing from this perspective. So it's kind of contradictory. Okay. Okay. I'm getting better, by the way. Next, I'm going like to play for a professional baseball team. I'm just kidding. They won't take me. I'm slow and I don't take exercise. But this is actually, those are good reasons. However, that was not the reason. The actual reason was that it, they told me it was too cute for academics. Have you seen an academic uh, title like of a paper? It's usually a paragraph. Like, for example, an ordered logistic regression model to evaluate and identify exceptions as a, and, and takes like, it's a couple of sentences. So if you have, for example, 10 minutes to present your paper, by the time you're done with the, with the title of your presentation, your time is over. That's how long they are. So to use just two words, exception and exceptions, that was not good. However, luckily my advisor was happy with it and we stuck with it. Actually, they idea case where they found it interesting and they implemented it in their latest version of idea so idea now has a feature that is called exceptional exceptions i was actually working with them again like i said we work a lot very closely with with those companies so i was working with alain soublier who was in charge of developing this feature from caseware now the concept behind exceptional exceptions is that when you run analysis, most of the time you end up with a lot of exceptions. That goes back to the same problem that if you do like, audit, uh, like a continuous auditing, you will end up with a lot of exceptions. How do you deal with that? I'll give you another question. Let's take a step back. How many of you usually have too many things on their to-do list? Okay, what do you do when you have too many things on your to-do list? What do you do? Push it back. Uh, so basically, you and you start with, for example, something that is uh, the ones that are more urgent, right? So you prioritize it by due date. What else? What other ways you can do that? Okay, so it, it, you, you try to prioritize it by the ones that are okay, the flexible ones versus the like hard deadlines, right? That's what I mean, like flexibility with the deadline versus hard deadlines. So sometimes you have like a hard deadline, you miss it, you miss it. There's no way around it, right? So you look at it by flexibility, other ways. Think about it, you have too many things to do. You can prioritize it by, for example, which one is more important, right? 
can look at it to say that, okay, so this one is a lot more important. So I want to start with the important one. Sometimes you want to say that, okay, this one only takes 10 minutes. That one takes like five hours. I'm going to say, start with the 10 minutes because I can check it off my list, right? It makes you feel better. Sometimes I know, I feel sometimes inundated to a point where I don't know where to start at all. So I don't do anything and I go watch sitcoms. I take step back. I can't do it. I just like, I can't prioritize. All of them are important. All of them are hard, have hard deadlines, for example. All of them take a lot of time. So, okay, what, what do I do with it? And keeps adding, by the way, this, this to-do list is like, like a curse at this point. But this is what you do. You find a way to prioritize it or to work on it to process this list. Okay? There are different ways. Now, when you think about it, you have using a sampling technique doesn't work. Based on our experience, in one of the projects we were doing, like um, I was analyzing put, like, what we call duplicate candidates to identify duplicates for uh, du duplicate payments. Okay. And I ran the analysis. And I presented the internal audit department of that company with my results. We had like 899 cases or something like that. What they, they immediately told me, no, 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 we cannot handle this large number. Please give us a better number. Better number meant like something less than 50. But that's not the right way of doing it. So I had to add additional account to make this, um, to make that analysis stricter. But we lost a lot of information. We saw in certain cases where the auditors, they get overwhelmed with the amount of alarms, with the amount of, uh, with the large number of exceptions that are flagged by a continuous auditing system that they would simply shut down the whole system and go back to sampling. That means all the system that you developed and that you put in place is gone to waste because you're not using it. So we started thinking about it in different ways. The way I thought about it was, let's think about it from, a, again, a risk-based approach. Which exception, because all these exceptions, they are not the same. Certain exceptions are more, they present a higher risk than others. Keep in mind that an exception is, it means what? A violation of a certain rule. When you did process mining, you found situations where you had like an unacceptable variant and then you had some very unacceptable variables. Did you remember? Do you remember that? You had certain variables that like had a ah, small violation. It's not like exactly the acceptable one, but they're not like a really big deal, as opposed to ones that, for example, where you ship you like where you have like segregation of duties or where you have some kind of things that you, you basically uh, or where you have like a, you ship a product before you receive the order or you make a payment before you receive the product or even before issuing. I mean, technically speaking, you should not make a payment before, before even creating a purchase order, but that happens sometimes. That happens sometimes, okay? I know that, for example, um, we had a research project with a public university that is, I'm not allowed to say the name because I signed NDAs, but it's a university that is very, 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 very close to us. But I'm not allowed to say that. However, so when we were working with the internal audit department, we were analyzing the data after um, they migrated from a legacy systems to ERP systems. You guys know ERP systems, right? So it was during that period of time. This is why we have Oracle now, financials. But at that time, it was a mess. Payments were delayed to suppliers, extremely delayed. There was like so many pro there were so many problems to a point where the university had to actually implement some kind of an emergency payment system. So they would make a payment sometimes even the suppliers sub like they, they basically refused to deliver to the university. They would say that, no, you're not paying us. We're not sending you anything. You exceeded your credit limit. So we're not giving you anything. And at that point, they had to do something. One of the things that they did was they kind of implemented this um, emergency payment system. And the emergency payment system allowed for payments that would 
while they would be more efficient in payment, like in paying those, it always caused duplicate payments. One of the problems is, well, the funny thing is that even the internal audit departments, they made duplicate payments. They are supposed to be like identifying those, they themselves fell into that trap. So when we were analyzing the data, this is some, something that you need to keep in mind. They were inundated with those problems. They didn't know how to deal with that. So we created a system for them, an AI enabled continuous auditing problem that would also you conduct an exceptional exception. Once it identifies all these exceptions, it would come up with some kind of scoring mechanism. That's the main idea behind exceptional exceptions. We talked about test, so you test 100% of the population. You identify those exceptions, right? If they are too many, human users have problems dealing with that. You talked earlier about like when you have too much information from big data, et cetera. As humans, we suck at identifying patterns and we cannot handle large amounts of information. We simply can't deal with that. So if you are inundated with all these exceptions, you end up having certain problems. Like for example, you cannot, you, it becomes a lot more difficult for you to first identify the true exceptions, what we call exceptional exceptions. It becomes more difficult to identify patterns because you have a lot of noise in the data. The data is messy. You know that like in real life, with the, data, the data that we've been using in this class, this is not really like real life. In real life, you have to deal with a lot more, like with a lot messier data. So identifying all these exceptions can be sometimes problematic for the user who will be examining those exceptions. And this is, this was the idea behind here, okay? So when we have large number of exceptions, one of the issues that can cause, that can be caused by these systems is you have information overload. Once you have information overload, it's like when I have too many to-do list, like too many tasks on my to-do list, I just shut down. That's counterproductive. We lose the whole benefit of using the system. So we started thinking of it from risk-based approach. Let's calculate a risk score for every identified exception based on the rules that they violated. The ones that present a higher risk, if you can only look at 100, look at the 100 that presents the highest risk. That's the main idea behind it. Okay? This is similar in a way to how Gmail, for example, how Google identifies spam transactions. Keep in mind that any, that not all exceptions are equally risky. Some of them are fine, although they are exceptions, but they are not that dangerous. Others are very risky. I'll give you an example. Let's go back to the example of Gmail because it also helped us with the conceptual part of exception exception. Okay? So, you guys usually, when, when you receive an email, it either goes to your inbox or it goes to spam folder. How does Google decide? They have an algorithm. How does it actually do that? Okay, so they look at it, but before they know if it is junk or not, they look at where is it coming from. So for example, if it's coming from an obscure email, it gets, say, a minus 200. Say that it's minus 200, because you don't know that person. If it comes, for example, from your professor with the same domain name, it's safer, so it gets plus 500. So let's say in this case, if it is coming from your professor, because plus 500, the topic, because you know that they text mine all our emails, right? Everything you send, and this is why if you talk to someone by email, if you talk about like an MBA program, automatically you start receiving advertisement for MBA programs, right? 
like I teach in the MBA program, and this is why when I when this happens, uh, I so I automatically start receiving emails about like me joining MBA programs because I'm talking about MBA. So let's say that it's talking about an accounting related product. It would get, for instance, plus two hundred. If it's trying to sell you drugs, okay, it becomes plus say. 400, uh, I'm sorry, minus 400. And at the end, it calculates the score. If it's positive, it goes to your inbox. If it is negative, it goes to spam. Now keep in mind that this is a, a simplification of the actual way that they actually do that, but just gives you an idea. Now the difficulty comes where, if for example, you receive an email from your professor talking about drugs, etc. Where should it go? Where do you guys think it should go? So it goes to your inbox. So you're saying that it goes to your inbox, right? It can go to your inbox, right? If you have been in communication with her for a very long time. So now if it comes from her email, trying to sell you drugs and has some additional negative points, how many of you ever like received an email from Rutgers to the spam folder? I actually got emails from my professors and from my, like when I was a PhD student here and it, it got also like some emails from right now from the chair of our department that would land in my spam folder based on the topic that they are discussing. So in order for me to make sure that every single email that I received from my for the chair of the department goes to my inbox, I add them to the trusted list. The trusted list, for example, would add plus 10,000. At that point, no matter what the content is, it will still go to my inbox. If I want to block a certain user, I add them to the blocks list. At that point, they get, for example, minus 10,000. Even if they have a Rutgers email and the topic is accounting, et cetera, it will still land in my in, uh, spam folder. Again, it's just a calculation of the score. There are certain complications, of course, that become like when you have multiple dimensions. Imagine that, for example, uh, if you want, if you're receiving an email from a friend talking about drugs from a Gmail, from a friend talking about drugs or something like that, most likely this will land in your spam folder because it's not using a, a, like a, a verified email address, right? What if you were in, in the pharmacy, in the school of pharmacy? What if you were in, this, in, in a medical school? In that case, you expect to talk a lot more about that. You, what, my point here is that you need to keep in mind that the, the rules can get complicated. Like in the analysis that we ran with the university, one of the things that we identified, like we found that there are certain places where they were buying animal food, pet food. The first thing that came to our mind was like, why? It's a university. Why would we have that? But then we looked at deeper. If, for example, Rutgers Business School buys animal food, that's alarming, right? What if it was the School of Agriculture? They have animals. Is it normal in that case? Yes. In a different project, we also had something similar. We were analyzing the procurement cards for a large multinational company, like the P cards, the purchases used by P cards. One of the things that we identified was they were buying diapers. Why would the company buy diapers? That was automatically flagged. We, for that one, we had, or, or that data was also audited by City. And they didn't find any problems with it. So we actually analyzed it. We ran 100% of the like 100% of the population testing, like we tested the whole thing, and then we started creating a scoring mechanism, a la exceptional exceptions, to identify the ones that are really problematic. One of the things that we found was that they actually have diapers. We raised that issue with their internal audit department. Apparently, it was fine. Who can tell me why? Sorry? 
trip, even if it is five dollars, you should not be using your card to do that. But they actually did. They actually, that company actually manufactures that diapers themselves. So they were buying diapers from their competitors to compare them. At that point, the R&D department had the authority or they were allowed to buy diapers, but not, for example, the internal audit department. So it depends on who's doing that. The point that I'm trying to make here is that those rules are too complicated. They're not as simple as just adding two variables. And some of the data sets, we have like 600 or like 550 variables, 550 columns. Just to understand those columns was a was problem. For the internal audit department project with Rutgers, we had 660 different tables, not variables, 660 tables that we had to go over each one of them to understand what data they have. That's not easy. Takes up a lot of time and skill. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. This is actually an excellent point. And this is why you need to make sure that like which accounts do you use in order to make sure to you pass. I mean, in certain cases, you want to keep the company secrets. In this case, this is why like Rutgers forces you sometimes to use Rutgers accounts. Like in our case, as faculty, we are required to use the duo. Like you know, like how the two-factor authentication, you guys have the option of using it or not. We are required to use it. I cannot log into a system without using that. This is just like to give you an idea of what these issues are. But like if you think about this one here, um, the idea is that, the idea is that imagine if each one of these is an exception. Where do you start? Where do you even start? It becomes very difficult to actually identify. Okay, and just to let you know, this one, it does look a lot like me. You see, it does look a lot like me. Just FYI. So, but, Full disclosure, those are not my hands. Do you have any questions on this? This is the framework for exceptional exceptions. That's how academic frameworks are. I know they are kind of boring, I understand. But the, the, just think of it like very simply. You have this system here that identifies the rule, okay? Which one, which transaction is acceptable, which transaction is not, or which one uh, basically you have the internal controls, etc. Can someone uh, create a purchase order and approve it? If it is violated, if this rule is violated, this would be like one of those rules. So you identify the data, the exception. This is the part where you identify the exceptions. The framework here was mostly this. We came up with different weights. We use an expert panel to derive the weight based on the risk. Basically, we looked at how risky each rule is to violate. Certain rules are very risky. If they are violated, automatically it takes a high negative score, a high risk score. And that after that, the auditor is presented with a prioritized list of exceptions. You want to look at 50? You can look at 50. You have the scores. You, now you know which ones present higher risk than others. You can now present or show the ones that are high risk, others that are low risk, okay? That was the idea. Now, an important feature is also the feedback. Sometimes, like, like I said earlier with the Gmail example, when you receive an email that is flagged as spam, but in reality, it's not spam, what do you do? You say that this is not spam, right? 
or if you sometimes receive spam filter to your inbox, spam email to your inbox, you report it as spam. Don't you do that sometimes? I do that sometimes. Like if I receive an email that is clearly spam, I report it. Or vice versa. If I receive an email, like I said earlier, something, something like, for example, I receive some email from a colleague and it goes to my spam folder, I say that this is not junk. This is not email. Uh, this is not spam. That feedback goes back into two sides. It goes back to the rules. It say that okay. So if an email is coming from that person, then it should be trusted. It adds the positive score to those emails. That's the concept behind exceptional exceptions. So you identify the exceptions. You add the weight here. You have a list of prioritized exceptions. Once those the amount is uh, that the auditors want is investigated, they kind of send the feedback to the system. Any questions? Good. This is actually I like this picture usually more, but um, I mean full disclosure I did not pay for these. Again, academics we take some liberties sometimes. <laughs> I was supposed to pay for these like. I think if I wanted to publish it, but I didn't publish it. I had to use the other one. So this is an explanation of what those are. Okay. By the way, cybersecurity, et cetera, they use this kind of analysis a lot because they want they usually they are hit with a lot of attempts, et cetera. So they have a lot of records that they need to analyze. Pay attention to this one. This is most likely going to be on the final exam. You have to be able to understand that to explain it. Okay, this is the model that is used in order to calculate the weights. Okay, and I'm just kidding here, but this is I, I I started doing this. I added the slide after my daughter told me that she spent four years in a PhD program to do that. I felt kind of offended. And I wanted to show that I'm smart and my work was impressive, etc. So I added the slide, but now you won't have to use it. But I actually, this is actually this is from the actual paper. Um, this is how academic papers look like most of the time. Okay, fun fact. Um, I know accounting can be dry, right? The accounting material in on its own, it's it's kind of dry. Sometimes it's difficult to explain. When I started teaching, at, I started with the mega classes. I had one of the, I don't know if you've been to New Brunswick. My office is in New Brunswick. I teach in New Brunswick most of the time. Um, I was teaching in those in the room where I would have like 300 to 400 students in my class. I mean, it's not difficult to know to notice, but I'm short. Sure. That room is huge. People way in the back, they can't even see me. I'm like just a speck at the bottom of, of their classroom. So when I was actually uh, in that classroom, when I was teaching, um, oh my God, I forgot what I was gonna say. I will remember it, but I forgot what I was gonna say. <laughs> what, what was I talking about before that? Hey, don't judge. I have a lot on my plate. I swear, don't judge. What was, oh, okay, I remember now. So actually, um, I used to record my lectures even before Zoom. So I started doing that in 2013 and before that. Uh, before like people switched to online, etc. I always recorded my lectures and I would have them there. Um, those, I mean, it's a financial accounting for God's sake. What, how, how interesting it, could it be? I know that I can get fired if, uh, if someone hears that in the business school, but this is the truth, right? I mean, it's, you're learning about debits and credits. So one time my daughter wasn't able to sleep and she said that, dad, is it okay if I listen to one of your lectures? I'm having trouble sleep. Can I listen to one of your recorded lectures? I like to think that it was because she wanted to hear my soothing voice. I seriously doubt that, but that is one of, she actually watched one of those lectures and she fell asleep in five minutes. Luckily my son is not as offensive, but. I mean, both are teenagers now, so they kind of. I'm pretty sure they won't be happy about me talking about that. So if you ever meet my kids, don't tell them that I talked about them in class. 
Okay, but like this is kind of in many cases, like when I start reading even what I write, uh, I get sleepy. That's why I drink a lot of coffee. This is basically simply saying that this is the sum of all the rules that were violated. So let's give you an example. If you are presented with this table, CRS is like cumulative risk score. If you can only look at two exceptions, which ones would you look at? By the way, those are te the tests here. Those are the, the controls here, the tests here are actual ones from, from the study. Which ones would you look at first? The ones with higher risk score. So you start with this one and then you go to this one. If you can only look at two, you can only look at one, you look at the highest one. Now, just keep in mind that in reality, you do that, but you can you also still need to look at the completely normal ones because even those can hide some information in them. So you don't just look at the exceptions. You look at the exceptions, but you also take like a small sample. However, like you use 90% from the ones that are risky and 10% you take them, for example, from the non-risky ones. Okay, that's how in real life it's actually applied. But this is the simple concept of uh, looking at those exceptions. Any so questions? Now let's talk about emerging technologies. And again, the reason why we have more and more emerging technologies is that the technologies have become a little bit more affordable. So we'll talk a little bit about artificial intelligence, drones, blockchain. Some of them will be simply like skipping through. Some uh, some of them will spend a little bit more time about uh, uh, like what? For example, artificial intelligence. Who? Uh, how many of you like use or encountered artificial intelligence? Sorry. Face ID, for example, face recognition is a form of artificial intelligence. What do they do? They actually take a triangulation of the like of certain points in in your face, like in, uh, in your face. They measure them. They put all these data, and this is why they ask you to turn around, etc., because they want to take a three D kind of a three D map of your face. And next time you actually open it, it will analyze it against its database, and if it is it's, if it is correct, then it will accept it and it will, it will unlock your phone, right? This is one form. What else? Siri. So if you use Siri, Alexa, Google Assistant, any of these digital assistants, right? They are forms of artificial intelligence. How does it work? So one thing that you need to think about with artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence is a way that basically it's a program that tries to mimic our behavior and our way of decision making. It's not the matrix. It's not an actual physical robot. It's not Terminator, for example. It's not an actual robot. It's simply, I mean, it can be used for robots, of course, but the idea is that this is a program that learns on its own. With time, it learns, becomes more accurate. So as an example, I don't know if someone it's something here. Siri, yes. So how does Siri work? Let's assume that I have, for example, if I have an actual assistant, a human assistant, and I ask them about like the weather outside, what do they do? They go to a database, let's say that weather.com or something like that, weather uh, database, they look up the location where I am, and then they report back to me, right? If you ask Siri the same thing, if you ask a digital personal assistant the same question, what does it do? It translates my command audio to text. It conducts text analysis, extracts keywords, for example, weather, my location. It goes to a database, locates the answer, then 
have the answer in text form, converse it to audio, and then it would give it to me. That's how it works, right? It's very similar. Driverless car, like uh, cars, like autopiloted cars, how do they work? Same concept, slightly more complicated. You have all these sensors. Usually when you are driving, what do you see? You look at the, if there's a red light or green light. You look at the stop sign. You observe, for example, speed limits, hopefully. <laughs> you look out for pedestrians, right? For anyone who's crossing the street. You look at other cars, how far away you are from them, etc. Am I correct? How does a car do the same thing? The car would have sensors and cameras. Cameras would take images, run them in practically real life to identify if there's a pedestrian or not, someone crossing the street. They look at the red light and green lights, etc. Stop signs. They have sensors to make sure that they are far away enough, like they are far enough from the cars in front of them and behind them, etc. When they are driving. This is how it does the same thing. It mimics our behavior. Okay, so this is the concept is not new with artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence has been around for years. The algorithms that we're using nowadays are practically the same algorithm algorithms that were used or that were developed or designed like in the 80s and even before that. What made it different? What made it different? today and what made it more popular is that the technology now allows companies to do that. Sorry? Like Alexa, for example, or Siri. You have technology that's not that, even for companies, accounting firms, for example, they don't, now you don't really need a supercomputer. In the past, only companies like IBM or uh, Google or Microsoft had these. Now what, start, what they started to do is they don't only use it for internal use, they actually sell the service. Caseware, for example, they have an AI product. Microsoft, they had these advertisements about using AI to come up with new flavors of beer, with new beer flavors. They actually also had other advertisements related to um, agriculture, they used AI for agriculture, all these things that we use the whole time. Amazon, Netflix, whenever you use those recommendation systems, they analyze this in a way that it would provide them with useful information. It would provide you with useful information as long as you sacrifice a little bit your privacy because that's what you're doing. When you tell the algorithm what kind of movies you like to watch, that's how it learns. By the way, did you notice like, for example, with, with time, Netflix becomes a lot more accurate and they would start presenting you with the movies that you actually like or the TV shows that you actually like? Same thing with, uh, same thing with for example, with Amazon. Like, I don't get recommendations for any Android product because I have an iPhone. I get a lot of advertisements for ad iPhone products, but not for Android. It learns from my behavior, from my purchase. So this is an interesting story. There was a guy like, like there was, I think it, if I remember correctly, it was with Target. They kind of, uh, a guy came to a branch complaining to the manager that they have been receiving a lot of uh, coupons and advertisement related to babies. And they said that they don't have babies at home. His daughter is 16. They don't have babies. Why are they receiving all this? spam mail, like this junk mail, why? So the branch manager uh, basically apologized, etc. but upon like further investigation, it turned out to be that the daughter was pregnant. The father did not know about it. So Target knew that the daughter was pregnant before the father, before her father. They were analyzing the purchases that she made. Based on the purchases that she made and the pattern of purchases, they link that to pregnancy. And this is why they started offering those automatic, like automatically spend, like send those uh, coupons for baby products, formula milk, etc. This is an interesting incident 
but it is a real one where you can actually use AI from a business perspective, Target did a good job. But from a privacy perspective, that's a whole different story. We don't, I mean, of course, AI has been used a lot by uh, law enforcement agencies to identify, for example, terrorism, etc. They use a lot of AI to identify, for example, different patterns. Follow the money. Have you heard this expression? Follow the money. They actually do a lot of that. You guys realize that, for example, the FBI hires a lot of accounting students. Do you guys know that? I mean, the white collar division, they hire accountants because you know how to follow the money. You know how to identify fraud. So you can actually identify this kind of, these kind of uh, problems. Okay. How does AI work? This is a very simplified example. Think of an AI algorithm as a child. How would you teach a child different shapes? How, to, how would you teach a child to distinguish between squares and circles? You bring a bunch of shapes, right? And you start telling the child, this is a square, this is a circle. This is a square, this is a circle. Square, circle. And after a certain period of time, you assume that this the child learned a little bit, so you bring in new data. You bring in a new shape and you ask them to classify. You tell the child, is this a circle or a square? If the child, for example, classifies it correctly, that's a good job. It means that they started to learn. And the next one, you also test it. If it is correctly, again, it means that they learned more. So now it's two out of two. You bring them a third shape. If they misclassify it, at that point, the same, this error on its own becomes a learning point. The child now will understand that, okay, they misclassify it as a result, they should have classified it as a square, and then they learn more from that. The child is the AI algorithm. Those are the training data. Usually in accounting, for example, you use historic data, you use the years before, like for example, from the past couple of years, you analyze the data and you see which ones turned out to be fraud or not fraud. And after that, you move on to do that. So basically you have training data and then the last ones are test data. So if you want to think about it from an auditing perspective, this is the AI system. And the training data is previous records from the previous years. Based on those, you have what we call labeled data. You have transactions that you know for a fact they are fraud. So you can say fraud, not fraud, fraud, not fraud, fraud, not fraud. After a while, the system will automatically start to identify the features of each category. Like for example, here they know that the features of the, of the square is that it has sharp edges, it has corners. For fraud, you find certain, for example, certain patterns. So you say that, okay, so this pattern, anything that comes like that is fraud. Anything that does not follow that same pattern is not fraud. With time it learns. By the way, you guys use antiviruses on your computers, right? That's how antiviruses identify new viruses. Keep in mind that it's easy to identify a virus that has already been, ca uh, like they caught it already, because now it's known. The program itself is known. But how do they identify new viruses? Because viruses, they behave in a certain pattern. They, for example, work at some weird hours. They use your resource, the resources of your computer, this is why it slows down your computer every time you have it, like if you are, your computer is infected with a virus, it, slow, it becomes slower. So you have this pattern. It tries to replicate itself by sending itself to your contacts. Whenever there's a, pro, a, a program that is like that, the antivirus software will flag it as a virus or as what they call sometimes a potentially harmful program. 
How many of you like ever saw like this message? A potentially harmful program was identified on your computer. What do you want to do with that? Most of the time you quarantine it. Quarantine it means like it prevents it from spreading itself and from harming your computer. You're not deleting it, but you're just like putting it like in a save and that's like locking it away. Which is practically the same thing. But you can retrieve it as opposed to deleting it where it goes away. Do you understand the concept here? That's how AI learns. And antiviruses, they actually use some kind of AI to identify that. Any questions? The formal way of presenting it is this. That's how it's actually used. So you have, you train the machine learning algorithm, you get a trained model using the training data. Training data is usually historic data, as I mentioned. You bring in the new data, input data is the new data. This is, for example, if you're trying to identify, how many of you ever like received a message from their bank when you're trying to purchase something with credit card, with your credit card, and it would to me automatically they block it or, um, or for example, tell you that there was a large purchase. Did you do that? Practically in real time. That's because they train the model in advance. When you write, right now, when you're making a purchase, they run the new data automatically before even approving it. They run it automatically in the machine learning algorithm, in the trained model. At that point, it is the prediction will be like, for example, say that with a credit card, it will be blocked because it's suspicious. You investigate it. You, you are asked to say, was it you? When you respond, yes, this is an additional training point that this kind of purchases is valid on your computer. Like for example, they would use on your credit card, they would usually block your purchases from a different location. If for example, a different country or a different state sometimes. If you do that every time from that same country, that country will automatically be added to the safe location. You can actually do it in advance. It can inform, for example, the bank that you are traveling to this country, and as a result, it would automatically be added to the trusted countries list or something like that. At that point, it won't be flagged. Do you see the point here, how it works? And that's simple. It's an iterative process. It continues to learn. This here, the feedback, is why we call it machine learning. Because it learns with time. Every time it learns, it learns from the mistakes that it made in classifying, and you corrected those, so it learns from them with time. And technology that has been like, these have been used in so many areas. But Google Translate, how many of you use Google Translate? Okay, do you got, how many of you use the camera feature of you of Google Translate? You use the camera feature? Can you explain to us like how it works? It depends on the language, for instance, but like most of the time, if it recognizes the language, the advantage, like uh, Google Translate has a feature where it can, instead of typing the word, you bring on, for example, your phone instead of in front of this sentence. In real time, it actually reads it, translates it, and it presents the answer on top of this one. It presents it on top of it. Like for example, I was presenting in Brazil for like I went to Brazil for a conference, and like we went to to like a restaurant. Okay, I don't speak Portuguese. As a result, when we were reading the menu, we were simply like I would put my phone on top of it to translate it in real time. How does that work? It's taking a picture, running and basically running um, an image recognition converts the picture to text, what we call optical character recognition, right? OCR, it converts it to text, and then it uses its own database to translate the data. Then it presents it like that. That's part of 
of AI. And this is, these are, this is just to show you how prevalent AI is around us. Whether we like it or not, it's there. It's, it's around us the whole time. Like, do you guys use uh, uh, McGraw-Hill or Pearson or, <clears throat> or Wiley Plus? Which one do you use? All of them. Okay, so for example, you know, like when they have these self-paced learning algorithms, this is some kind of AI and it learns with time which areas you have deficiency and where you need help. All these, this is just to show you how prevalent that is. Oh, a proctor track. Do you guys remember proctor track? Okay, proctor track was AI based, right? It's a camera that would monitor you. It would flag any like if someone walks behind you, it flags that. They had so this kind of algorithm that would identify any irregular mo motion behind you. And it's up to you as it's up to me, for example, as instructor to say that, okay, this is okay, this is not okay. AI would use that additional pieces of information to improve themselves and to refine their model. Drones. What does Drone, like what do drones have to do with accounting and audit? Can you give me an example? We have until 1245 or 1250, right? 1250, okay. I'll give you an example. In the past, pre-pandemic, the auditors would have to go physically to visit certain location to investigate, for example, inventory, count inventory, etc. During the pandemic, with limited physical travel, they started to use different kind of videos. Video cameras, drones, etc. To do this kind of work. So if you want to visit a certain, for instance, a, a, a manufacturing plant, you can actually do that using a drone rather than going there physically. This is one way of using drones in auditing. Can you give me another way? Drones can be used to, for example, evaluate the progress on a certain project. We are actually currently involved in a research project where we're looking at government auditors and we're looking at uh, the use of drones to, for example, evaluate progress on different projects like roads or bridges, etc. Go ahead. Sorry? to get more information or deliver information to someone. Okay, I, which is, this is something that actually Amazon was um, experimenting with, right? To kind of use drones, automated drones to deliver certain products. The, there are also like drones can be used to count inventory. For example, you know, like those RFID cards, like the easy pass, for instance. Dealerships, like car, car dealerships, sometimes they have like thousands of cars that are very similar, same color, same model, etc. but they have different features inside. How would you identify if you want, if you're looking for a specific model? You'd have to go and locate and open a couple of them to make sure that this is the one, or you would have like to have a large sheet, etc. but it's inefficient. Instead, they can actually attach a reader, an RFID reader, the drone, and they would put tags inside each car. You want to locate a certain car, just fly the drone on top of them until you find the car that you're looking for. These are not just a hypothetical example. These are certain, of course, they are still not widely used, but they are, they are actually in use in certain cases. There's an example of uh, basically using uh, drones for to count inventory. And by that, like I mean, for example, to uh, they attach a, a barcode reader to do, actually, let me show you like a, a short video. It's funny, I like it. 
I hope that I will find it. Oops, this one. Okay. So which one is it? Can't remember if it's this one. Nope. Here. I think it's this one. Have you seen this one? I mean, this gives you an idea of like how this can be used, right? And uh, just keep in mind that this is still it's an, at an early stage, but this is like a company that actually sells those products. They sell those services. So one of the things that like drones can be used for is like, for example, inspection. You know, like for example, if you have a project and, so, and the contractor is trying to get uh, a certain, like they are claiming that they finished 50% of the uh, of the project, and as a result, they wanted to get paid for 50% of the project. You need to evaluate that this actually happened. Instead of sending someone there physically, you can actually fly a drone and evaluate that. Okay. Damage assessment. So if you are, like, for example, if you want to send an, someone to investigate damage like fire that was caused by fire or by like a hurricane or something, <clears throat> you would not want to send your auditor to a building like that. It's high risk, right? If anything happens to the auditor, that would be a liability. I mean, I'm pretty sure that my wife would not mind sending me there, but that's a different story. Rutgers would not want to do that, unlike my wife. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding, by the way. My wife, she says she likes me. See, I told you I'm funny, right? This is actually my backup plan. If I don't make it in academia, I plan on going into like stand up comedy. But sometimes I'm told by my kids I'm not funny. And you are kind of just confirmed that point. But you can use like drones in for those multiple things, okay? Now, this is the example that this is actually what drove us to think about uh, <clears throat> government auditors using uh, drones, for instance, in their audits. Because in certain cases, government auditors they have to audit or they have to audit the pro progress of bridges and um, uh, as well as, for example, new projects and roads, etc., that are done using uh, using, for example, <clears throat> funds public funds, et cetera. So one of the things, instead of having someone dangling from like a rope like that, I, I would never be doing it. You can't ever, you would never find me dangling from a rope like that. And this is not efficient and it's dangerous and it's not effective. You can do the same thing using drones. One of the advantages as well of using drones in these cases is that drones would also allow you to document your work. Keep in mind that with 
In auditing, you have to document everything that you do. So this is one, one way to keep <clears throat> track of all the needed documentation. Okay. <clears throat> this is another example where, and this is a real test that was done with, uh, with one of our friends with EY. They actually tested how they can use aerial images. So they take a picture using a drone, and then they use an AI counting software that would count sheep. These are sheep, okay? Have you ever seen how sheep are counted in real life? First time I saw it, it was like really difficult. I mean, first of all, they all look the same. Second, they run very fast. So you have at the gate, you have two people standing on each side and literally counting one, two, three, four, five, six, et cetera. They're trying to count the sheep as they go inside, as they are, as they herd them inside that area. Every time they reach a hundred, they tie a knot. They have, they hold a rope and they tie a knot. That means this is 100. So imagine if you had someone who's like annoying, like me, a friend like me, who would like, it would be like 71, 72, 73. And then I would ask you, Hey, do you want to go for coffee later on? And then you forget everything. You forget where you were. So it can mess things up. The numbers are not accurate. Takes a lot of time. You make errors. I mean, come on. We've all watched cartoon. You guys watch cartoon, right? You see that like usually you count sheep when you cannot fall asleep. So you're this, you're doing something that is by design. It's meant to make you fall asleep. That's not easy. Whereas in this case, you take an aerial picture using a drone, a high image, a uh, high resolution image. And then you start, you break this one into smaller quadrants. And the system, as you can see, would identify those, like would look, start looking at those. I mean, not all of them are correctly identified. Some of them may not be sheep. Some of them may be like shrubs or a dog, but it would be counted as sheep. So you have to go there and teach the algorithm what they are looking for. So you can actually start, okay, so this is correct, this is correct, this is correct, this is incorrect. You do that and with time it learns. Based on the uh, preliminary results that they found, they were able to do it in a fraction of time of what the actual physical auditors do, the traditional way. So they did it in, in parallel to compare the results. They were more accurate. They did it like twice or three times faster in that like they were able to repeat it multiple times from scratch while the auditors were doing that one time. And that was a test kind of to see how effective that is. Now the technology is there. This does not mean that this is how people are doing their jobs. There are a lot of, unfortunately, there's what we call sometimes resistance to change. If you're, how many of you have like MacBooks? In my opinion, MacBooks suck for analysis. Let me clarify for analysis. Because like idea will not work on MacBooks. You guys realize that, right? You know that? You still haven't told them the good news? <laughs> you can't use MacBooks for idea. You can't use MacBooks for RPA. Power BI, which is similar to Tableau, doesn't work on MacBooks. It only works on Windows machines. So there are ways of doing that. Now, why wouldn't you simply switch to Windows or why wouldn't I simply switch to Macs? There's what we call resistance to change. You're used to doing work in a specific manner. To change is not easy. So a lot of people do what we call resistance to have this issue of resistance to change. They push back against implementing new software. A lot of faculty here, for example, when we switched to the pandemic, they didn't want to switch to online. I mean, before the pandemic, I know several of my colleagues would say that, no, I would never teach online until the pandemic hit and they were forced to do that. Still, some people didn't agree. They were so resistant to change that they retired rather than switching to online courses. 
There's nothing wrong with it. I'm not judging anything. It's not a question of wrong or right. It's a question of this is how I'm used to doing that. Like you guys, many of you probably use Google Docs because they are easier to share, etc. Why wouldn't you switch to Microsoft? You know that you can share the same thing. You can use SharePoint, for example, and can use shared documents. Why don't you do that? Because you're used to using one that works. If it's working, if it's not broken, why fix it? That's the same concept. A lot of people still don't use AI or advanced analytics because according to them, the old ways work. Then why change? Plus, we mentioned it earlier, you need to learn new skills in order to be able to do these things. So if you want to learn new things, that's not always easy. You guys are still young, but the, uh, like the older you get, the more difficult it gets to actually learn new skills. You have too many things on your mind, you don't want to learn new things. So, so this is one of the deterrents of using these kinds of uh, emerging technologies. Any questions about AI before we move on? Any questions, like whether they're related to what we discussed or, or different? You also need to understand something related to that same topic. Not that you can't be an expert in everything. You realize that in this course, the goal is not to make you an expert in all these technologies that we're covering. You will not be an expert in Tableau in two weeks. You won't be an expert in process mining in one or two weeks or in blockchain or using like IDEA or using RPA. The concept here is to introduce you to those emerging technologies so that later on you can pick one that suits your job and your future career. This is what I want to do. I want to become like a programmer. Then you are better off like learning Python and start using that. Or I want to become a, a visualization expert. Then you do that. Or I want to learn how to analyze controls. Then you, again, you learn more process mining. All these things. So you kind of later on specialize in certain areas. I know I have a PhD in accounting, but I'm not a financial accounting person. So there are a lot of accounting areas that I'm not good in. I specialize in certain area and that's what you will eventually be doing. Blockchain. Okay, how many of you heard of blockchain? It's a buzzword. Everyone heard of blockchain, right? So. He raised his hand for a second. Oops, sorry. It's a buzzword, right? And everyone talks about it. Oh yeah, blockchain, this is interesting. We want to implement blockchain. <laughs> the funny thing is that many people don't really understand what blockchain is about. They just know that it's a buzzword. It reminds me of the story of like the naked emperor where no one wants to say that they don't understand what blockchain is so that because they don't want to sound like they are kind of ignorant about it. So they say, yeah, yeah, blockchain is very good. Okay, what does it do? And this is where everyone goes silent. But blockchain is actually a technology that was developed in order to have, the main issue is that it is a decentralized technology. Most of the time, you have, for example, the bank. They have the main data. Like for example, if I send a payment to Professor Jean, the bank will keep track of it, of the, tra the bank will verify the transaction, the bank will verify that I have enough balance, the bank will make sure that it arrived to her bank account and once it's complete, it sends confirmation that it is sent from my account to her account, right? <clears throat> the idea behind blockchain was to avoid having this organization in the middle. It's sent from one person to the other. Now, let's say that I, I sent her $500 and I claim that I sent her $1,000. So I say that I sent 500. She says, uh, I sent 1,000. She claims that she received 500. Who is right? That's the concept behind blockchain. 
it is a decentralized ledger. It means the ledger is with everyone on the blockchain, or at least like everyone on the blockchain have access to the ledger. For me to verify, to, 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 in order for my claim to be the one that is added to the blockchain, added as a verified transaction, we will compare my claim to your ledgers and her claim to your ledgers. Whoever is correct, their transaction will be added to the blockchain. This is in plain English how it works. It started off, and this is one of the reasons why it's used widely with Bitcoin. Most of you, like whenever you talk about blockchain, you think of Bitcoins or similar like cryptocurrencies, right? Because this is was one of the this was the first application, like wide application of blockchain. Okay, but there are other points that are related to blockchain. Blockchain uses cryptography. They, they use encryption to make sure that the data is tamper proof. Basically, it's very difficult to falsify the information because of the verification process. Now, you also heard probably about how blockchains can hurt the environment because of block of like Bitcoin mining and stuff like that, right? Why is that? Because it uses again, they're trying to solve the encrypted. The encryption, they try to solve the encryption to find the solution in order to make sure which transaction is the correct one. So mining is basically the verification process for the Bitcoin network, for the Bitcoin blockchain. But one of the advantages, as I said, is that it is tamper resistant. Unless, for example, 51% and more of this class, unless more than half the class collude with me and conspire with me, you will find that, okay, my claim is false. Unless you're working with me, which is in, in certain, like in, in reality, it's not practical to have 51% of the people trying to falsify a single transaction. So the majority of you will actually side with Fang Bing and say that, okay, my claim is not correct. As a result, my claim will be rejected. Her claim will be added to the blockchain. Okay, it's just a ledger, as I said. So it's a, it's a ledger. And the important part is that you need to understand it's decentralized. It means there is no single central authority that would verify the people. And this is why it's kind of anonymous in certain cases. It's not exactly anonymous, but it's more anonymous than traditional accounts and stuff like that. Okay. Any questions? Now, in addition to that, so the, how does it work? And why do they call it blockchain? So the transaction is, the first transaction, for example, is added to the blockchain. Transaction one, then you have transaction two. It takes some information from transaction one and from transaction two, and it encrypts them. Transaction three, takes information from transaction two and its own transaction and it and then they are encrypted. So now let's say that I want to falsify transaction three. I will have to actually solve all the previous ones. Makes it a lot more time consuming. It's not impossible. It simply would take me like, for example, 10,000 years to solve it. Okay, or let's say even like 10, 10 years. But by that time, transactions four, five, six, et cetera, would be based on transaction three. So to falsify it, this is why we call it tamper proof. To falsify it, it becomes very difficult. And usually, if the transaction is verified, it's added to the block. And then each block, once it's basically it's fully, it can go to the next block, and the block will also be linked. They are linked. Keep in mind that each transaction is looking at the previous ones. It has some pieces of information of the previous ones. That makes it robust, different, difficult to uh, falsify. Now, another advantage of blockchain is smart contracts. Smart contracts are self-executable contracts. 
self-executable contracts are good because they are more efficient. They are more, um, uh, basically, so more efficient. They are less prone to human error, etc. Do you have any questions? You're awfully quiet. Okay. I'm going to assume that you guys got the points here and you're fine. And you have this information, you can actually use it. There are certain places where, for example, it allows for a shared database that would not let you, uh, that would uh, lessen the requirements for redundant reporting or redundant um, posting of the same data. XBRL. How many of you heard of XBRL? Okay, XBRL is an extensible business reporting language. It's a machine readable format. And by machine readable, it means the software would read it directly. I want you to look at the screen here and tell me what problems can be caused by these, uh, uh, be kind of like caused by the instructions. Okay, so look at this one. And then you have, so you look at the given information and then look at the instruction. What do you, what problems do you anticipate? Go ahead. The date, the date, is it day, day, month, month, year, year? Or is it month, month, day, day, year, year? Like in the US, we use the month, day, year. In Europe, it's like the day, month, year, right? So etc. So the date, which one is it? And sometimes, like certain systems start with the year, actually, because exactly like in chronological order. So it starts with year, month, day. What else? So this is one problem. Sorry? Yes. Okay, so it's not clear which person on the right. Person to the right, yes. And there are actually two problems with person to your right. What if it was like, for example, like you? You don't have anyone to your right. Then what? What if you were sitting on the way, like on the right? Uh, so there's no one on your right. Am I correct? What if, what about, is it the person to your right today or the person to your right on that day? Is it the person to your right now when you're receiving the instructions or is it the person to your right when you're meeting on that day? And someone online said the dollar. Is it US dollar, is it Canadian dollar, or what? It doesn't say, it just says dollar. What else? What about this one? I was fresh educated. To me, this is five. I grew up, the comma is a decimal marker. And the dot is the thousands marker. In the US, the comma is the thousands marker. So is this five or 5,000? To you, it's 5,000. Right now, to me, it's 5,000. Growing up, it was five. I mean, neither one is wrong. And actually, this reminds me of an interesting story. You know this data set that I mentioned that we had, like we ran 864 gigabytes, it was large, etc. When we ran analysis on that one, I found a transaction for the amount of $660 million. That was reversed. Someone made the payment for $660 million by mistake, and they reversed it. So the company didn't really lose money. 
but that's one scary state. So we actually raised that issue with the internal audit department. Apparently they have super users who have the authority to make payments and adjustments for unlimited amount. Now this is scary, but at the same time, you need to keep in mind that this is something normal. The company still needs to make sure that if something like that happens, there must be someone who's able to fix that error. So, and the only way by the, the only reason we captured that was because we ran 100% and like we ran analysis on 100% of the population. And that actually allowed us to find a payment for $660 million. What do you think happened next? Well, I applied for that job. I thought, hey, I can make a mistake and retire early. I didn't get the job. That's why I became a professor. But anyways, that's a different story for another day. <laughs> the thing is, that was apparently a problem because that was a multinational company. And according to the explanation of the internal audit department, there was a problem with the format of the data. So it was not supposed to be 660 million. It was supposed to be different because of the different formats used in multiple countries. This problem should not have happened. So when you talk about HTML or XML or XBRL, those markup languages, have you ever seen one of those? Do you guys know what it is like, what H how HTML looks like, for instance? Let me show you that very quickly. This is how it would look like. This is the actual information that is sent to your, uh, this is the actual information that is sent to your, uh, basically, computer, to your internet browser. That's what your internet browser sees. It reads it, it converts that information. So for example, you have here certain fields that are links, you have certain fields that are Images, it will tell what image to include, where, and where to place it. It reconstructs it here. Your internet browser receives this information and reconstructs it. And as you, as human user, you would see this one. That's what it means, okay? So let's go back to our example. The advantage of using a markup language, a machine readable language, it would allow you, and by the way, the reason why I'm just, um, mentioning it here, machine readable format makes it a lot easier to analyze the data because you already have tags. Think of it this way. I don't know your names. I don't know which programs you are in, and I don't know when you graduate. Imagine if I had to ask each one of you to introduce yourself, to introduce your year, Introduce, for example, what's your major or where you're interning or where you're going after you graduate. I would have to ask each one of you. Now, instead, let's say that you have, I give you like multiple tags, pieces of information, pieces like of white stick, like sticker paper. I ask you to write this information and put them on yourself. At that point, I look at one of you, any one of you, and I can read the tags and I would know that your name, your class, major, where you're going, et cetera, et cetera, right? This is what we mean by tags, HTML tags, the tag that would show that this is an image or this is a link. In XBRL, you have tags. The 5,000 that we saw, saw earlier, 5,000 has tags. What are those, those tags? What format are they using? Go ahead. Date, okay. What else? You have currency, right? Which fiscal year? Which account does it come from? Is it, for example, cash? Or is it from like petty cash or whatever? 
where is it coming? Which account does it refer to? All these are different tabs. In this case, the computer would read the amount, would automatically know that this is a 5,000, not five, would automatically understand the currency. This is US dollars, fiscal year 2021, et cetera, et cetera. So it has all this information built in. As far as the system is concerned, it would read the count as this. As this. It's cash, cash equivalents, and short-term investments. That's not how we see it. That's how your software sees it. The presentation is how we see it. Could be in English. Cash and cash equivalent. Could be in French. Content, content equivalent. It doesn't matter. So you can have it in different languages. Okay? As you can see, the label is not changing. The label is what the software sees. The presentation is for us. It doesn't really matter. Can be in any language you want. You can add additional tags, like with you, where you want to go later on, etc. It can add like references, the standards, where it comes from. You can add also, like for example, explain the calculations, how it is calculated. Additional information, such as, for example, the currency, the fiscal year. And are there any formulas that are included? Okay, so all these things become XBRL. And XBRL value has all these tags attached. You don't have to explain each column. And to, for you to understand, all publicly traded companies in the US are required to publish their financial statements in XBRL as well. Any questions about that? Text mining. I'm not an expert in text mining. My colleague is, and he does that for, like most of his research relates to text mining. Professor Zhang also is good with text mining. She can talk a lot more about this than I can. But basically, the idea of text mining, when you're analyzing text, you're looking at unstructured data, like social media. Think about text as social media. How do you extract information from that? How do you confer? It's difficult to analyze unstructured data. The idea is that you want, for us to be able to analyze it, we want it, it cannot be like, like freestyle. It has to be structured in a way to, for us to understand or to make any meaningful uh, to extract any meaningful information from it. So you have to convert unstructured data to structured data. How do you do that? You do that by counting. Okay? So this is an example that my colleague, I took this these slides from my colleague. And FYI, it's okay not to be an expert in everything. I don't have answers for all your questions. I will try my best, but don't. I know for a fact that I don't have answers to all your questions. But when you talk about a movie, you talk about that if you want to examine or evaluate what's the overall consensus regarding or what's the overall feelings or sentiments regarding a specific movie, how do you do that? You start looking at different <clears throat> reviews. You analyze different reviews. Then you count. What can you count here? You tell me, what can you count here? What can you count? Look, look at those ones. Sorry? Brilliant? You said brilliant? Okay, so basically you want to calculate, basically if you have any good, um, like positive work. You have like brilliant. You have good. And you also want to calculate what? To count what? Negatives, you're right. So basically, you also want to look at hate at. That was not on me, that's on you. But basically, you have like negative words as well. On you, and it's not my fault. I, this time I didn't hit anyone, I'm happy. 
but you actually have like grades. Now, you also need to pay attention to what? To words like that. Not hate, it flips the meaning. Not great, if you say that this is not brilliant. It's not brilliant, it's not brilliant. That makes a difference. But in general, you start counting them. You have how many times do you have brilliant? So this is again, a simplified example. Count how many brilliant, how many good, and then you kind of come up with a score to see this is what we call sentiment analysis. That when you extract them is most of the time, I mean, there are software that does that. Professor Zhang here, she actually writes her own code in Python to extract this kind of information. We use that in financial statements. When, for example, you can examine the footnotes, you can examine MDNAs, item 1A, et cetera. If we want to extract certain information to see if what, and like some of the analysis is related to press releases or conference calls. My colleague, for example, Kevin, he actually examined, um, he wanted to see CEOs and which CEOs are more truthful. Are they the ones that speak without um, stuttering or without, without the mm, et cetera? Or are they the ones that like, speak? Who, who's lying more? Who's the lying CEOs? He ran analysis on that. He kind of would extract information. So if you listen or you, uh, if you uh, listen to a conference call, and you have someone who's well prepared. So the, the idea could be like they, they are well prepared because they are lying, so they prepared well. Or they are lying, this is why they are suffering, they don't know what to answer. So it can go either way. You run your analysis to answer that question. Keep in mind, data analytics is all about answering specific questions. Data analytics are not, is not about just running data like that. So you have a question and you're trying to answer it. That's how. Why or, or why would you use something like this? You have total number of words. This is something that you can lo look at. Total number of sentences. You look at the, for example, the positive words. You can have different dictionaries. Sometimes you can develop your own dictionary. Instead of looking at just words, you can look at what they call like sentences or like you can lo look at three, four words. So that, for example, if you want to see that very, okay, it's not bad, it's very bad. Or if, for example, it's not good. So you can look at all these things. Okay, look at how the lexical diversity, are they using different words? They are not, I mean, they are different types of, ana of analytics. This is not just one analysis. You just look at all these points. Okay, any questions? Um, by the way, if you want to just play around with something easy like that, look up regular expression. I'm happy also to share some slides with you on that. Regular expression, there's a free software that is called Notepad++. I think there's one on that it also works on MacBooks, but I know for a fact it works on Windows. Um, by the way, MacBook users, don't worry, you're not out of luck. Professor Zhang will be sharing with you also another way that you can access remote machines that are offered by Rutgers Business School, which already have IDEA and UiPath, et cetera, and so on. So you're not going to fail that course because of that. At least not this course. At least not because of that. Let me put it this way. <laughs> but so this is the way that when you look at um, regular expression in that software, there's an option where you can specify. For example, if you can look at any letter, like, you know, like how if when you open Word, for instance, you can click Control S and search for a certain word. Instead of searching for a word, you search for a pattern of words. But for example, it would be if you're looking for a social security number, what's the pattern that you would use? Sorry. So it basically it's a, it's a bunch of numbers. If you're looking at credit card pattern, they also have a specific pattern. 
if you want to specifically look for Visa credit cards. They all start with four. So the first letter has to be four. The first number has to be four. The remaining ones, it has usually a, little, a certain number. You can look, look at the certain number depending on the credit cards, etc. Phone numbers, same thing. Email addresses. To locate an email address, what does it have to do for a fact? End with? The, not necessarily. It can end with .com, .gov, .edu, right? It must have an at, right? It can have words or letters before that. It must have at least one letter before that. It can have certain ones like it would allow, can have dots, it can have dashes, et cetera. So you can have, you would have to kind of play around with it. I can provide you with additional information if you're interested in that. I didn't include it here because I did not want to overwhelm you, but you can actually do all that. Okay. This is an example that we ran with uh, an actual project that we did with a county in Nevada. You have to admit this is. Pretty cool, right? Come on, give me credit for it. I looked for it, like, because that we we this project was with the county in Nevada. They only had their internal audit department had one auditor, one internal auditor. She would every Friday she would go over the payments. She would eyeball, literally eyeball the transactions to find duplicate payments, but that's not really efficient. She was overwhelmed. She had to do all the tasks, all the other internal audit functions. So she was overwhelmed and they reached out to us and we kind of came up with this method. We created an exceptional exception method for them using various criteria. You need to understand that the criteria depend largely on the company itself or the organization itself. But this is another application, a real life application of the concept of continuous auditing and exceptional exceptions. So. So this is what we did. We identified the, this. I mean, this is just, I mean, we're running out of time. I just want to give you this one as an example. FYI, duplicate payments, duplicate vendors, duplicate customers, they happen. Okay, whether you like it or not, they happen. How many of you like have multiple accounts in a specific service? Which example? Okay. So you have multiple accounts for the same person, right? Now in certain cases, like in academic journals, when we submit, we use the same editorial system to submit journals, but to submit articles to journals. But different journals, they use the same one. I have like three or four accounts on that system. Not by me, I didn't create them. They created it for me. This is simply a redundant thing and it allows for fraud. In certain cases, it allows for fraud if you're using these as such. So this is just an example. You can go over it later on. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me uh, or to Professor Zhang and she will kind of forward it to me as well. That's the same concept. It, it is using a cumulative score and it would Start. You start off with a full population, you identify the candidates, and then you prioritize them and present them to the human user for further analysis. This is like a bunch of links that can be helpful to you. We have a lot of information that are already available for free on YouTube. You can watch them, or you, they kind of range from undergraduate courses all the way to PhD courses and some of our research. Okay. And this is, I included here my information. You have like, I usually hold my office hours on Mondays and Thursday from 10 to 11 a.m. If you have any questions about this, please let me know. You can also let know Professor Zhang and she will forward that information to me. Any questions? Uh, th that will be an extra $5. $5. $5. Yes, I will, I will send them to, uh, to Fang Bing after class today. Any other questions? Thank you so much for coming today.
And I hope that you enjoyed it. And thank you for not snoring. Even if you fell asleep, you did not snore. So that I would appreciate, I appreciate that. And I wanted to thank you. Thank you so much. Anyone who wants candy?